Klein and uh, I'm delighted to chair the last session of uh, automatic writing uh, where, we'll, where we will explore how artificial intelligence uh, relates to our human nature. And um, that's a topic that's as fascinating as it is difficult. And it is um, difficult not only um, because we are talking about technological utopia here, or maybe dystopia, um, but it is uh, difficult by the very definition of artificial intelligence. Um, for um, artificial or machines displaying artificial intelligence, um, uh, machines that are able to perform tasks that human mind can perform in the same ability or better. So, but do we really know what human intelligence is? And um, do we at all um, uh, know how the brain generates our minds, our intelligence? I think uh, we are just scratching the surface of such questions. Now, the topic is fascinating um, because it um, addresses um, so many philosophical questions um, uh, that have boggled minds for 2,000 years, like um, morality, like power, like... Um, personal identity. And um, I'm delighted uh, to discuss uh, these questions with a wonderful panel uh, tonight. Um, please uh, welcome Petra Ritter, um, Marco Cornell, Temi O, and um, Uziel uh, Avret. So, um, Uziel, um, you are a philosopher of science, and um, you had you have a long-standing interest in understanding consciousness and human minds. Um, what promise um, does artificial intelligence make in advancing such questions? Okay, so first, well, to talk about the promises of artificial intelligence, obviously it's a huge subject. Uh, those of you who were here yesterday in the talk by Marcus de Satoy got a sense of the enormous advancement of computers. Uh, for example, in 1972, Hubert Dreyfus still came out with a book, What Computers Cannot Do, and uh, then he came up with a sequel, What Computers Still Cannot Do, but computers are just moving a little bit too fast, and um, now, at the beginning, people thought, okay, they can't really beat us in chess or in a game like Go, or they cannot uh, do this or that, but uh, uh, nowadays, uh, it's quite clear that they can be creative, they can uh, really do almost anything that we uh, can imagine, and... Uh, Obviously, this is going to change things uh, drastically. One of the questions is how fast is it going to change? Uh, one thing to think about is the so-called the singularity. And uh, here, already in 1961, an English uh, philosopher, engineer by the name of Good asked what happens when uh, computers will be able to build machines that are uh, more intelligent than themselves. And we're getting very close to uh, this, uh, this stage. And he says that once that happens, then uh, this would probably be our very last invention. I mean, if we can invent a computer that can invent a machine that is smarter than itself, then it's probably going to be something called amplification that would leave us far behind. And there are different reasons for that. Uh, one has to do with the speed explosion. 
And by speed explosion, we're talking about um, computers that simply can process more information per unit time. And uh, the increase in this capacity to uh, process information increases exponentially. And uh, there's so-called Moore law, where uh, it seems at least that th this capacity doubles every two years. And this has been going on for a while. Now, some people will say, well, you know, it's about to stop, because most things in nature that grow exponentially eventually uh, stop for different reasons. But still, we are uh, in the midst of an incredible speed explosion. And uh, at the same time, you can have uh, increases in intelligence, meaning that the uh, software engineers devise more and more uh, powerful software that can uh, do the job better. And once you combine the software together with the speed explosion, the two explosion kind of couple, at the same time, all that could produce better hardware, better material research that in turn can increase the speed and so on. So, uh, and the question is, what happens if there is such an explosion of uh, the capacity to process information where computers will just leave us way behind? At some stage, uh, for them to interact with us would be excruciating because it would be for us, for me, interacting with this glass. If you look at a piece of glass, for example, from 300 years, if you've ever seen them in churches, they begin, to, they're, they're actually amorphous, they move, but they move very slowly. So what I'm saying is that uh, They'll be dealing with something that's about a million times slower than them, and that, that uh, could be boring. So anyway, but this, this is, if we look at the, the far future, or, or maybe 30, 40, 50, 100 years, but uh, there are also tremendous things that are going to happen in the near future. I'm sure that, that uh, all of you have uh, experienced it. And, uh, and perhaps if there is one thing that uh, still we don't see how computation can help us with is this business of consciousness. For those of you familiar with the heart problem. So you can have, for example, a, an amazing computer that can do a fantastic amount of information processing and uh, beat the world champion in chess or go. And at the same time, it seems like all the information processing happens in the dark. There is really a... a there's not, what is it like to be for a computer? If a computer, for example, receives a electromagnetic radiation at the red frequency, it is not going to actually experience red. And uh, while you take something like a cat or even a mouse, and they probably, there are very good reasons, although we cannot prove it, that they do uh, have something, they do have something on the inside. It, it, it's not dark on the inside, and uh, it is something which it is like to be a cat, for example. And uh, as a matter of fact, I think that the more, this might give it to the panel, that the more, uh, the better computers become, perhaps the more mysterious this business of consciousness becomes because there's perhaps less room to, to hide. And now we know that most of the, our most creative, uh, most creative parts of the information processing in our brain happen in the dark. You don't need consciousness for that. As a matter of fact, you're really creative uh, when you actually uh, process information uh, unconsciously. And there, there are many, uh, there's a lot of research on that. So uh, this business of consciousness is still very interesting. So this is something that I, I, I deal with. Uh, Petra, you are a computational scientist, and um, your work is about to literally um, bring uh, some light into um, what is going on in the brain. And um, uh, to do so, um, you use computers um, to simulate um, brain functions. Um, uh, can you tell us? Um, uh, can you tell us where we are standing at this time? Right. Yeah. So. Um Maybe I show you a simulation of a brain that you get an understanding what we are doing. Um, I'm going to show you a slide. This is my colleague, um, Jessica Palmer. She works in our lab um, and her brain. And um, what we are doing in our um, section of brain simulation at the Charité is uh, we are constructing computer models of the brain and simulate the brain 
on the computer, and the goal is <coughs> to um, reconstruct patient brains in the future so that we have a digital brain of a patient and are able to use the digital brain to test therapies. But uh, in order that this really works, we need to have a right model. And how do we constrain a computer model so that it becomes a patient's avatar? So here you see now imaging data. This is again Jessica. And um, we acquire many different types of imaging data and uh, reconstruct many different parts of the brain. So here you see that we parcelate the brain and we reconstruct the connections. And then each of these nodes is represented by mathematical models. And the mathematical models are interacting through the nerve fibers that we are individually reconstructing. So all the geometry, the fibers, this is all Jessica's. And in my brain, it would be different. The distances would be different. The connection strengths would be different. And we can take account all this in order to do personalized simulations. So each of our lab members, of course, um, has their own brain model. I have my brain model. I have it also here on my phone. Um, and I have also a neuro headset and can directly feed my own activity on my phone and visualize it. Um, so these are four of our lab members and all their brains are individual. So now you might wonder, you might know that we have many neurons in our brains. Uh, so one says about 80 billion or 100 billion neurons and uh, they are highly connected and there's no supercomputer in the world and even if you would take them all together that could simulate what is going on in our brain. This is impossible right now. We use supercomputers for our simulations, but what we can simulate <coughs> sorry, is much more coarse. So what we do is we take advantage of a phenomenon that is very common in nature, which is synchronization. So here you see memorations of starlings. And you see that they are behaving similarly. So one bird um, follows the behavior of the neighbors. There's synchrony in the swarm of, um, on the flock of, of birds. And this means that it needs much less complexity to describe this. So we don't need to have the equation of each bird. And we do not need to have the mathematical equation for each neuron. We can simplify because there is a lot of redundancy. And this is what makes our life easier. So we do a simplification. And by the way, what you see here are no birds. These are neurons that we are simulating. Um, but they look like birds because they behave, behave like birds. This is um, the principle how we do it. We, for each region in the brain, and this can be much finer, we make uh, simulations with one million of these nodes. But this is just for you to see. I show it here. So these are the nodes. And these would be individual neurons, exciting neurons and suppressing or inhibiting neurons, red and black. We are not simulating those. What we do, we describe the behavior of a population, of a flock of neurons. And by this, we reduce the complexity and we can simulate an individual brain. And here you see it. This is Jessica's brain simulation. You see the activity and you see that we reconstruct everything underlying the activity that we can observe. So we <laughs> use a computer model in order to describe all the complex interactions in the brain. And this is the crucial point of what we are doing. It would be impossible for me and for everybody here in the room to just think about how these many neurons or neuronal populations could interact. This is impossible for our mind to think about such a complex thing. And therefore, such a model helps us to, um, to take into account these complex interactions with mathematical descriptions. But on the other hand, it's not just a dead computer model. It's something that is personal because we integrate the information from the patient. So now, the question of consciousness. So this generates, as you can see, activity. How? can we know whether, even if we get much better, and uh, I think uh, later I'll show you some things that we can do with these simulations, but how could we know if we would reconstruct the perfect brain in this way, even if we would not 
reduce anymore, but simulate, and maybe 10 years, we have all the computing power and could simulate each individual neuron, each individual interaction. And our computer model, the virtual brains, this is how we call this platform. Everybody, every scientist can use it. It's open source, and many scientists are using it. So how could we know when we then run in 10 years our simulation of maybe my own um, brain avatar, and this brain avatar is giving an interview here, talking in a panel, maybe probably it is much better than I, it plays wonderful piano, um, and it composes actually the pieces that it is playing. So how would I know whether it has a feeling when it plays the piece, the piano piece? I could ask, and the avatar would say, yes, I enjoy this, so it's, a, it's a lot of fun, or I'm sad, I have pain, if you hit it, it says, ouch. But uh, we do not know what, what this computer model really feels, or whether it feels something, and most likely it does not feel anything, because it has this darkness, um, there is nothing, there is no experience, and there is something that is beyond what we would reconstruct. So even if we would have an identical copy of the brain, one could now think, okay, it's such complex, and in the moment when it has the complexity of our brain, the consciousness somehow magically appears. One could think that. But one could also think differently. So where would be this conscious experience in this brain? We can observe every neuron. So would it be a single neuron that experiences what all the other neurons are doing? And they are um, generating activities as is pain. And then this observer or experiencer neuron says, okay, I receive this information, but where would that be in the brain? That doesn't make sense, right? So I think um, there is probably more to it. And I'm very happy that actually we have in the panel um, um, a physicist who deals with quantum mechanics, I think. And this could be actually an answer, but I, I want to give now opportunity to my colleagues to also talk, and we have a lot of time to go more into this there. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mark, you are a non-fiction writer, and, um, and Petra um, has taken us a little into the future um, where her and many of her colleagues um, research of, um, uh, of simulating individual brains um, could um, Lito, she has talked about an avatar um, giving answers as she does, or maybe even better, who knows. Um, and um, you have um, explored, um, well, kind of the end of the road in the future, where um, people are dreaming, um, or hoping, um, uh, should I say, um, uh, that their personal brains can be uploaded into a, a computer in order to make their personality immortal. Um, can you um, tell us a little bit about um, whom you met, what people were thinking, what you experienced? Sure, well, my book, um, to put it, in relatively simple terms is about uh, transhumanism, which is, um, I don't know whether I should define it, but uh, a movement which is, I suppose, oriented towards uh, a merger of uh, humans, human minds and human bodies uh, with technology. Um, so that would include things like uh, implants to give increased physical and cognitive capabilities, um, things like uh, cryonic preservation of bodies after death in order to um, hopefully reach a point where they can be uh, reconstituted at some point down the line when, if and when the technology ever became possible. Um, ultimately, the sort of end game of transhumanism, though, is to transcend uh, the body entirely, to transcend the human condition. Um, by which I mean uh, a lot of things, I suppose, but also ultimately transcending death. Transhumanists are ultimately <clears throat> concerned with uh, the uncomfortable fact that we all have to die. Um, so one of the uh, ways, and I think in fact probably the, uh, the most significant way in which transhumanists foresee this happening is through sort of radical extrapolations of um, the kinds of things you've been talking about. 
um, I spent um, time with uh, a computational neuroscientist who works on the problem of how um, various sort of um, uh, areas of sort of cutting edge research in, in brain science and uh, the kind of thing that you do might uh, eventually down the line contribute to a scenario whereby you might in fact be able to upload the mind of a human individual uh, and you would have a conscious mind inside a machine. And this sort of connects with, um, <clears throat> with what Uziel has been talking about in terms of um, the sort of radical intensification of the power of um, computational technology and eventually you get a merger of these two things and you have um, so a merger of uploaded consciousnesses with super intelligent machines and what transhumanists are talking about is a sort of kind of a godlike post-human existence whereby the um, the capabilities of, of the human mind are sort of endlessly augmented uh, and this is known as um, the singularity. Um, so I spent um, about a year and a half uh, traveling around, mostly unsurprisingly I suppose in Silicon Valley where these ideas are um, generally taken a lot more seriously than they would be in, in the rest of the world and in fact you know are subject to uh, a fair amount of uh, venture capital funding and these kinds of things. So these ideas are very current there and uh, you know as, as um, Randall Coyne, who's the computational neuroscientist who I spent time with, said he's from uh, from the Netherlands, from Groningen, and he said uh, I asked him, you know, about uh, ending up in Silicon Valley, and he said, well, the thing about being here is that when you're at a party or a dinner and you ask people what they do, uh, when, pe when someone asks me what I do, uh, you know, when I answer that question in the Netherlands, they tend to look away uncomfortably and think I'm insane, whereas in Silicon Valley. Uh, they ask me, you know, what's, you know, how's my funding going and so on. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a, and it, it intersects in, in very interesting ways with the kind of culture of sort of radical tech, technological optimism that you get in, in Silicon Valley. So that was kind of my interest in, uh, in that world. Timmy, uh, you're a novelist, um, but you have an undergraduate um, background in, um, in neuroscience. Um, and um, for this literary festival, um, you wrote a short story which you call Panopticon. Um, and it is a, if you want to put it thus, um, a first step. You're describing a first step into the um, future Mark just um, describes. Maybe you just want to um, expand a little on the Panopticon and um, and I wondered what made you invent this story. There must have been some interest of yours. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, I was, well, partly because I was asked to write it for the festival, but um, also um, I studied neuroscience as like an undergraduate degree and um, I did some modules in like the philosophy of the mind. And I think uh, so, like a lot of the things you were talking about, about the hard problem of consciousness, I found really interesting. And I thought that fiction is a really good way to explore different kinds of answers to it. Um, I was really excited because I read Mark O'Connell's book as well, which um, sort of when I was like researching for transhumanism. And I noticed that there is almost like a, like their ideology is really interesting. It's almost religious, the idea of sort of transcending the body, but they want to do it like through science. Um, so in my story, The Panopticon, um, the characters, they live in a world where you can get an implant that basically plugs your brain into the internet. And um, I found it quite interesting, the presentation you just did, because they sort of, it's, it's kind of a fictional device where um, you were saying that you sort of model the behavior of groups of neurons. Uh, in my story, the technologies move forward so you can look at individual neurons. You can like you have a machine that can directly interface with each neuron, which means you can build like a neuron for neuron picture of the brain. And um, so, <coughs> sorry. So the characters use this to like interface with the internet and it's sort of, it's almost like having a smartphone in your head. Um, in my story, the main character is about to have this implant done and they've reached a stage where it's quite commonplace. And she goes into, um, she comes out into the world and realizes that her mind has kind of been expanded. Like, 
I, I guess in the same way as maybe we feel when we come across like different information or the freedom that we have now because of the internet, she feels like she's, it's like internal. And um, so it's quite an optimistic book. For her, it, it frees her. She's really... You find it optimistic? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I find it's interesting. I <laughs> yeah, for her, she finds it quite freeing, I suppose. I was, I was even thinking about this when I was walking around Berlin, and I kept like looking down at my phone to look at a map. And in my story, she has a map in her head, and she can find places. She's not sort of tethered to a device. So, um, yeah. <laughs> but um, I also find I also had a point to make about the things you were both saying about the hard problem of consciousness. I find it quite interesting that you assume there might be darkness inside a machine, I suppose, because from ourselves, there's only, we only know what pain feels like from ourselves, from our own personal experience. It's hard to prove, it's hard if I pinched you and you said, ow, for me to prove that you felt pain in the same way I feel pain. And so let's say we had a machine and we modeled it in a certain way. And if we, I don't know, touched it a certain way, it said, ow, how do we know? I, like, I can't be any more sure that it's not conscious, that it doesn't have this, it doesn't process pain in the same way. Can I just ask um, a question? Yeah. So, um, actually, I would not be sure whether you all would be just machines who simulate. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I know, so. I know that I feel pain, <laughs> but I'm not sure about you. <laughs> so I find it hard to, yeah, assume that if we, if we had a conscious, well, if we had a machine that could model the human mind, that it didn't have a, what it's like to be that machine in the same way as... Uh, well, I mean, um, in a way, the question goes to you, Petra. I mean, um, t t how many different individual brains have you been simulating in the last years? Several hundred. Several hundred, okay. And we are um, now going so in several thousands, so we are getting okay. larger. <laughs> uh, right. Um, uh, so, um, t t how significant are the differences in uh, the, the structural differences that you, uh, that you would find? So it how individual are we? Uh, yeah, it depends on your perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so I can take the perspective that our brains are not so much different from mouse brains, actually, mm -hmm. um, because we use the same software to simulate mouse brains, and there are the same principles. We just uh, change uh, the distances between the regions and the number of regions, a little bit uh, the representations, but all the principles are the same. So we can use the same software to simulate a mouse brain. Um, on the other hand, of course, there are differences. There are differences between females and males, between the ages. It's very clear that we find um, differences with aging, with development, um, but also with training. So if you search for differences, you find differences. If you search for uh, commonalities, you find commonalities. And of course, there are general principles that apply to all our brains. Well, well, uh, well I mean, let's, uh, uh, let's put it um, uh, uh, thus. Um, uh, uh, are the differences so big um, that they would make you assume um, that um, I feel pain in another way than you do? Yeah, I think it would be, I mean, we are now building brains on a computer that in principle could show exactly the same features as my brain, but uh, would you believe that this brain in the computer feels pain? So your brain might be even more different from the computer brain. Um, I wouldn't be convinced that the computer brain feels pain. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I suppose that's like the argument from analogy. It's like, I assume you feel pain because you're made of the same stuff as me, and I feel pain. You're, you're built in a similar way. We come from a, another human. But like, I don't, if we could make the same thing on a computer, just because it's made out of microchips and carbon and silicone, it might, I think we're, we're sort of like arguing based on the stuff that it's made of, I suppose. So, so I think, one, I, I, I'm totally fine with the theory that if there's a certain degree of complexity, consciousness emerges, so to say. Mm. So this is okay, but uh, I'm not, not uh, so, um, I think there's more to it, actually. I think this is not all. Um, and um, uh, the question is, what is it? So I think the key point is, there needs to be an experiencer. There needs to be an instance that experiences something. So it's, 
the feature of making an experience that makes a difference between being alive or being not alive. So where in your brain and my brain should be that instance? Is it the entire brain that has the experience? Is it a region in the brain? Where is it? So if it is the entire brain or region or a single neuron or whatever, then we should be able to find it. But then, um, what would be the mechanism? So would that, why would a neuron, imagine it would be a neuron in the brain. So what would be the mechanism of the neuron to experience something? It's the same problem, right? So it, it, it always comes to the same problem, and therefore I think there is something else. I come later back to this. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I ask what may be a really stupid and obvious question? But the work that you do seems, in a way, very close to the kinds of things that I was hearing so many transhumanists talk about, like these kinds of technologies or what, where they see the possibilities emerging from. And do you see, I don't want to say possible because that's too broad, but do you think that we will get to a point when you can have a conscious mind of an individual in a, in a machine, whereby this thing that's on your phone can be in some way you, or a copy of you that is functionally <laughs> so, uh, you. Yeah, with, with your question, you put uh, your finger exactly in that wound, is that we do not know what that experience is, yeah. what, what makes up the experience, right? Mm. So therefore, um, it's, uh, I could say yes or no, but it, it wouldn't help much, right? Yeah. Um, so, what the interesting question is, I think, is really what is it that brings up the experience? And so, I think um, that a computer who does a simulation, or who, I say who, that does a simulation, um, is like um, some computer that forecasts the weather but doesn't generate rain, right? right. So, um, and uh, so it's a hollow thing, it can generate signals, it can generate responses, but um, I think it would not feel. This is what my, I'm convinced of this. Mm. So, but the physicist knows that um, there is more, there is not just, um, there's duality um, between waves and particles, and um, uh, if you want, to define an electron, for example, um, so an electron can in a way be nowhere and anywhere, right? But if you want to measure it, then, then in this moment it becomes a particle. So this is, this is a dualism. And uh, I think this might be, so imagine there is um, a quantum soup <laughs> um, in our brain and in the moment when you have an experience, the measurement basically takes place, and this electron that is nowhere or anywhere becomes a particle. So in that moment, a universe is generated, the universe that we are experiencing. What is your opinion about this? Okay, I, so I just want to make a, a couple of quick points. One, one, one of them has to do with the brain simulation and it's important that we realize that, say, 10, 15 years from now, brain simulation is going to be look quite different. And the work that you're doing is very important, but it's one level. So, for example, already today, those of you who are familiar with the nematode, it is a, a tiny worm, the size of a millimeter, and it has about 300 neurons. And um, there's been a lot of research done on that specific organism try and map the whole organism. All this, and the nice thing about it is, is that there is a collective uh, project. If all the scientists are working on this uh, organism, some are mapping out its uh, locomotion system, some are ma ma mapping out its brain, some are mapping out its digestive system, and, and so on, so, and, and they can actually put the whole thing together. And then when more scientists find new uh, data, you can store the data in the in the worm itself. So the worm itself actually is a very nice way of storing data. And the distance from here to a Google brain is not that big. A Google brain means that all the scientists that are doing research on, uh, on the brain, on different parts of the brain, will begin to store their data. And these are you, many, many terabytes of, of information. 
and they're going to bring to store them in the right places and pretty soon you can get a pretty a powerful simulation. So for example, you can have a, set, a Google bacteria which uh, will simulate a bacteria with the genetic uh, machinery, with the proteomic machinery, with the epigenetic machinery of a bacteria. And then at some stage, you're in a much better position to do the Google neuron. But once you do Google neuron, then you're in a much better position to do the mesoscopic uh, systems that you're working on and do some kind of a frequency analysis and frequency analysis really is, is it's a, some kind of an average response of, of, of the tissue. And, uh, and so on and so forth, so you get the picture that you can have, just, just like you have Google Earth, when I say Google Brain, and you can actually go in there, so if you're a scientist, you're interested in one part, you go in, you're interested in some aspect of that part, you go inside there, and you can actually magnify uh, the parts that you're interested in. And obviously this will also uh, enable us eventually to, to have much more powerful uh, brain simulations. When it comes to consciousness and uh, so-called uploading, again, what you have to think about is some 20, 30 years from now, so slick or 150, slick salesman comes, knocks on your door and, and say, uh, you know, how would you like uh, immortality? And, uh, and uh, you have to agree to subject yourself to say to a certain process that will uh, somehow uh, replicate your brain. Now, there are different scenarios. One of them is called destructive uploading, meaning that the original has to be destroyed, like in the science fiction novels of Vernon Vinge. You have to destroy the original uh, to, in order to create the upload. And, but then you can see your wife and your friends and everybody says, you know, you know, it's fantastic and, and we have all these capabilities now, but these don't, you know, say maybe they're not really conscious, they're just, functional isomorphs and they behave conscience and and uh, but you know if everybody has undergone this pr procedure you know except you and your mother-in-law <laughs> you may be uh, you may want to do it but but obviously it's a huge problem and i guess when we come to consciousness and quantum mechanics there's a more serious question here uh, in, in some sense uh, that, that, that it seems as though consciousness, if it is physical, if you're not a dualist and you think that it is something completely outside of space and time, then consciousness is very, very difficult to uh, define. As a matter of fact, the biggest problem is somehow to understand the relationship between consciousness and space-time. Because most physical processes evolve in space-time, they unfold in space and time. It can be described sometimes by physical dynamic equations and so on and so forth, but... So one option is that consciousness is some kind of physical process that unfolds in space and time, like the ones we're familiar with. Another one is, no, it's got nothing to do with space and time, it's outside of space and time. And then you're a dualist, and then you have a huge problem to explain how someone can say, I'm conscious, and I'm sure that it is my consciousness that caused me to make this claim. And if... Uh, you're a dualist, then consciousness cannot act back on physical matter in any way. And then it's very hard to explain how you can make such, such statements, despite the fact that dualism has other problems. So maybe there's something in the middle, some kind of new physics, a new understanding of space and time, especially the relationship between information and space and time. And some of it may relate to newer forms of, of quantum mechanics. And uh, so really, in, in, in the world of consciousness, if you look at philosophers, it, it really you can make a very rough uh, division between those who say, you know what, this is a philosophical problem, and uh, it is a conceptual problem, and we're going to find a solution. Some of those are eliminativists, like uh, Daniel Dennett or Keith Frankish, uh, or illusionists, meaning that they believe that uh, we are somehow uh, disillusioned about consciousness, that there is really no such a thing, but we're just conceptually confused and it is the task of the philosopher to somehow uh, clean this thing up and, and remove the source of confusion, but, but really it is an illusion, there is no consciousness. I think that's a symptom of just how difficult the problem is. Uh, other people, uh, me included, think that, you know what, maybe we don't know physics exactly, we don't know everything about physics, we don't understand matter as well as we think. And um, in the future, once we uh, have some more powerful theories, and uh, especially those that have to do with the relationship between information uh, 
and space-time, we may be in a better position to understand what's going on. But when it comes to uploading, it's quite possible that you, you can have a functional isomorph of your brain that functions almost in the same way, but lacks uh, some of the finer uh, physical processes that are may be crucial to consciousness that may have to do with exotic uh, states of matter and uh, spatial temporal. Maybe I can add uh, something if we can go back to the last slide we um, showed. Um, exactly. So, um, since you were mentioning the many scales from the molecules, actually the genes, molecules, the uh, metabolic pathways, uh, proteomics, um, then uh, the cellular level. So everything that I mentioned before is a subcellular level and there happens a lot uh, in the brain. Cellular levels and the circuits and all the stuff. So there's a human brain project. You might have heard about it, the European Human Brain Project, where um, over 70 institutions and um, uh, 200 or 300 PIs, uh, so principal investigators, are working together and they are, um, so this is a very ambitious and challenging project and uh, there's a hot debate also always going on whether it makes sense at all. But um, with the virtual brain, we are part of the human brain project. Um, I got part of it a little bit later, just in the past two years. Um, and I know exactly what is going on. So what is going on is that platforms are created that collect all the pieces of information and try to integrate them with dynamical system theory. So what you see here in the back is um, a description of dynamics. And what we have to understand is that all the interactions, the hierarchic interactions between the many different temporal and spatial scales in the brain, they are not fully deterministic. This means that I cannot predict my brain activity for the next 20 minutes. That's impossible because there is some randomness in the brain. And this is in all scales, but there are possibilities to, to deal with this random, non, not fully deterministic system. And this is dynamical system theory <laughs> where you can explore the repertoire of a system. So you do never know where exactly the system goes, but you know under which condition it will do what. And this helps us a lot to understand how the different levels of the brain are interacting. So we are now far away from just looking at frequencies. We use um, state-of-the-art mathematical methods in order to describe the non-linear, the highly non-linear interactions between the different scales. And what you see here, these little arrows, these are field flows that show you when you put the system in one of these positions. Um, so you can, for example, stimulate the brain. Then the trajectory of the system that is here described, the part of the brain, would follow such a field flow. And there are attractors, and stable attractors, unstable attractors. So this is highly mathematical, but we need exactly these mathematical methods from nonlinear dynamical system theory to understand the system. And it needs the collaboration of many, many scientists because there's so much different information. So all the experimental observations at many different scales with many different um, methods. So I have no idea about several parts of, of what, what other scientists um, do, but at the end we need to integrate this information. This goes back actually to machine learning and deep learning because what we are doing in the uh, brain modulation is really understanding the interactions between the neurons and the parts. Machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence, this is statistics and we also need this but at the end, it is just statistics to then make some sense of, 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 of uh, some features of the data. But this is not the causal relation between the parts that are interacting. This is something different. And this is, in my view, what we really need to understand in order to understand how the brain works. Um, I, would, uh, I would like to involve the two um, <laughs> uh, writers and in... Um, and, uh, and uh, I have a point in doing so not, not only for politeness and not only because we are at a literary um, festival here, um, but um, uh, rather um, uh, we have been, and this is, um, and this is, quite, um, this is quite typical for such um, discussions, we have been um, uh, talking um, for half an hour now um, about the brain as a kind of... Um, 
disconnected system, a highly complex system, but disconnected from the rest of the world, um, uh, which, uh, which of course it is not. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, the brain um, is, um, is connected um, uh, to the world, well, very obviously, um, at least through our bodies. And um, this is what you have been exploring um, in, in your works, um, Temi and uh, Mark. Mark, you have been exploring it um, through the, um, by looking at the hope of um, some, um, well, mostly highly affluent um, individuals um, who hope that they ultimately can disconnect their brain or their personality from the uh, bodies by uploading the um, content um, of uh, of the brain into a machine, and you have been exploring it um, uh, by um, by uh, by having your hero have an implant um, uh, through which um, which is connected to the brain, which is connected to the body, and by which it connects through a large environment. Maybe you you want to say something about it. Uh, about the implant, or about well, no, <laughs> um, no, um, uh, about um, uh, about. Uh, well, I read your story um, as an expression of your interest. Um, how your consciousness of about which we have been talking in quite abstract terms now um, is connected um, to your experience um, and to your. Ex but to your experience of the world. I mean, and this is what the story is about. Yeah, I mean, there, there is sort of a scene early on in the story um, where one of my characters is considering how when she looks outside, like at the light outside the window, she finds it hard to believe that that sensation is caused by, I don't know, cells in her retina firing and mm -hmm. sending messages back to like a, a certain lobe in her brain. And she thinks like, but my experience of the world feels so rich, my inner life feels so rich um, that it, it that almost seems like a, I guess, like a reductive explanation of the way I feel. But then she s thinks about like the internet. And I remember when I was reading about like code and how it does kind of seem amazing to think that the whole of the internet is like ones and zeros. And it's basically like microcircuits switching on and off. And that a video is that, that Netflix is that, that emails I send to my mother are that. And um, so I suppose, I think maybe it's just thinking about the fact that when you look at it just from a sort of like informational level, it doesn't always feel like it encompasses the like richness of our inner lives mm -hmm. and our personal experiences. Yeah. So what's missing? I I I find this quite hard because That's the hard question. <laughs> I huh? would I would believe that maybe nothing is missing. <laughs> uh -huh. Maybe we just look at it and we think, oh well, it feels like it's more important than just that. But I mean, especially say if we look at the internet, it's a fact that that is what it is, like the ones and zeros, it's code running through a, like a computational device that like creates light and that's what a video is, you know? Um, and I, for me, um, I find it quite interesting that you described, I think you described yourself as a dualist or maybe, <laughs> I don't know, because like when I was studying neuroscience, like I went into it, I think try, thinking that maybe I'd understand something about, I guess what I imagined was like the soul or consciousness once I understood about the brain. And, um, and I think a lot of people don't think that's a crazy thought because I think we all naturally think, oh, well, there must be something else. We kind of assume there is. And then when I was studying, I think I sort of had that intuition like beaten out of me. Um, <laughs> I, they sort of said, why does there have to be something else? Like, mm -hmm. it can be, I mean, me looking at blue can be certain cells firing in my retina and my brain um, bringing back memories of things like sky and sea. And that doesn't make it less important just because I can describe it, you know, if that makes sense. Good question. So who are you or what, what is you and you? So if, if you remove mm. an arm, mm -hmm. it's still you, right? Uh, so what, what is the you in you? <laughs> <laughs> See, I find this hard. I mean, I suppose I definitely identify with things like my memories, like in my like hippocampus. Yeah, but they're information. But then, <laughs> but then there are people who, I, I don't know, memories in lots of different okay, so ways can degrade. If it would be just your brain, let's say it's your brain. So your brain is then having the experience of sitting here and looking at me. <laughs> so it's your brain, your brain experiences this. Your brain has that perception right now? Yeah. 
<laughs> there's also so much more. I mean, the body is I mean, like experiencing things at the same time, and you, like you're not just thinking. This is the thing that I encountered so much with the transhumanists that I met and, and spent time with was that they tended to conflate themselves with their minds. Mm -hmm. So they were definitely dualists in this really quite hard and radical way. Um, but and, and it's quite a persuasive thing in a way because we're, like I, I live mostly in my own mind and you know I see that something like uh, you know what you put up there and I had a kind of a flashback to when I was writing the book which is quite a long time ago now but I, I would spend like quite a long time uh, having these kinds of things explained to me and I'm a complete layman I have no scientific background whatsoever so you know people would be very polite and sort of uh, solicitous and explain it to me in very simple terms and I would be struggling to to keep up with it uh, and sort of following along relatively well. But then I would always have these moments where I would pull back and I would think, this is crazy. Like the, the, the language uh, is, is very rational and what I'm seeing is very rational. And what's being explained to me is, is sort of a lockstep uh, rational explanation. But when you pull back, the implications of it are so mind blowing. Um, and it's as though you're being, ex someone is explaining to you something that is completely crazy in the most rational, logical way possible. And I found that really mind blowing and very sort of, um, yeah, real cognitive dissonance. But it, exactly, um, it, 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 if, I, if I understood you correctly, um, in your essay you, you uh, found a neuroscience mind blowing, as you put mm -hmm. it. Um, but you couldn't quite well, the idea of uploading a <laughs> well, consciousness yeah, to exactly you you uh, you couldn't quite believe the implications or you're quite skeptical um, uh, so what's uh, what's it to nourish your skepticism to, to nourish my skepticism yeah um, well <clears throat> my skepticism sort of comes and goes so i'm huh. i'm agnostic or ambivalent uh -huh. about a lot of this stuff um, so I, I am skeptical about a lot of the more radical claims of transhumanism, for sure. Like, um, and I'd love, love to hear your opinion on these things, actually, as well. Like whether a self, an individual, could be sort of run on the substrate of a computer and so on. Um, but for me, the skepticism is not actually. I try to hold my skepticism at bay, and I I try to not use it as uh, the primary tool in my writing. I try not to use it as a hammer to smash things down. I try to keep it back because no, but I'm, you don't hide it either. Uh, no, it, it comes out like it has to come out. Um, so, I th I, I'm probably dodging the question a little bit here. Yeah, I'm extremely skeptical f about whether we should want to be immortal and to upload ourselves to machines. Whether it might be possible is another question. Um, but you know, I'm also skeptical about my skepticism. Like I, I it depends on who I'm talking to. You know, mm -hmm. if you use the right language, if you're a good enough salesman, I can almost be brought over. For sure, and that brings me to another point, which is when Temi was talking. Uh, I've had this exact thought, this exact experience, so many times, where you said, you know, maybe that is all there is. Maybe that's precisely what I am. Maybe I am just these zeros and ones and, and neurons firing. And that's the sort of transhumanist view, and that's the sort of rationalist view of, of what we are. And I think I have I have that thought a lot as well. But I also think the difference maybe is is just a difference of language and. I would say this as a writer for whom language is maybe the primary thing, the, like the primary uh, locus of our experience in the world. But maybe the difference between talking about a soul and talking, and talking about what we're seeing here, it's just, a diff it's just a different language. The language of the soul is maybe more persuasive to me and maybe more poetic and more um, inviting. Uh, but maybe it's just a different way of talking. See, I, I, that's sort of like a kind of conclusion that like I've personally come to, I, I think just because just because someone can describe something in a scientific way doesn't make it less awe-inspiring. And um, yeah, I, I would say that it, it is a difference of language. Like I was quite interested recently, um, like in oxytocin, like the people say, like the trust hormone. And a lot of people are like, oh well, you know, so maybe this is the thing that makes you feel trust. And let's imagine that like we could say, okay, this neurotransmitter and this like combination of neurons makes you feel love like if we could describe it that still doesn't make it i guess less meaningful 
And, um, we can't at the moment. <laughs> yeah, we can't. But even things that we can describe, like things like, I don't know, seeds growing. Mm -hmm. Or um, when I was studying embryology, we were learning about how something goes from a single cell to a human being. Like, even if you, even if you understand all of the stages, it still doesn't take away from the fact that I found no. it magic. Mm. Yeah. I fully agree. Um, I, I, I think it's a good point um, to open the discussion to your questions, and um, I would, um, uh, uh, or may I make, uh, may I make a very humble request, um, and the request is in the interest of all to really ask questions and to really ask brief questions. Thank you. Um, the question to all of you, uh, do you think it's possible, or if somebody already is working on it, to uh, keep a brain of somebody who is going to die, who is uh, in case of age or who has an accident, or if just the brain, could it just kept alive, uh, with a, connected with a computer or something, that the main... Uh, uh, yeah, the important, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, features uh, can be connected like uh, um, uh, with a camera, the eyesight or the, uh, you know, the speaking uh, with loudspeakers or with, with microphones, the, the main uh, features to keep alive. Uh, uh, as I heard, the, the brain is capable to, uh, to uh, live much longer than the the rest of the body. So is somebody uh, thinking about that? Uh, what is the status about that? If it's possible, thank you. So, uh, so in the moment it's not possible, <laughs> you, you know that. Um, I think in principle, even though it's a, a really challenging task to do this, in principle, um, reconstructing all the interactions and also implementing the memories that a person had I could imagine this is in principle possible. Um, the question is, if you have this all in a computer, um, how helpful will that be? How useful will that be? So uh, usually, I mean, we are interacting. I'm talking to you. You are nodding. You talked before. Um, we are sitting here. We are moving. Um, so you need to have an embodied brain somehow. So that, uh, you mentioned that if it is an, in a computer, it could control a robot, for example, right? It could even control a voice or just print uh, some, some thoughts on, on the display. And then you could exchange with that brain that you loved and you want to maintain. Um, and that would be already nicer than uh, if it would be gone. Um, and this is exactly the point. So I think in principle, having so I do, not think, I do not say it is possible. I do not say it is possible in 10 years, but I think in principle I can imagine that it is possible. What I don't know and I cannot imagine because I do not have the answer yet is will that brain feel? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I, I feel like I have two possible answers to your question. Um, one of them, I was reading an article um, that this was published in May about scientists who collected a pig's brain from an abattoir and sort of like put it in um, like electrolytes and that simulated the body and gave it like oxygen and the same amount of like nutrition. And they found that it did show some neural activity. Um, and so people aren't entirely sure what that means or if that means it's conscious. But then also you're discussing um, can, I guess you're asking can a brain survive death? And um, there have been a few instances of something similar to that. So there's like, the like clinical death. Um, when I was in university, there was this woman called Anna Bagenholm, who was a skier, and she fell into the ice and um, suffered hypothermia and drowned. Um, she was like clinically dead for 80 minutes, like her heart had stopped beating, she didn't have brain activity, her body was um, like cooled like beyond what you'd imagine would sustain life. And when she was flown to the hospital, they rewarmed her body and they gave her CPR. They took um, her blood out and like warmed it up and then fed it back into her and she came back to life and she gave us the lecture about like how it happened. And the reason that that worked is because um, 
when you freeze something, as you notice in the freezer, um, chemical reactions slow down. And um, so that means that lots of the cells that normally, if your heart stops, your cells need oxygen um, for their metabolism. And um, if they don't get that, they die. But if you're frozen, it's sort of like, if you put something in a freezer, the metabolism slows down, the cells don't need oxygen, so they don't die. So she was kind of preserved in that way, which was one of the reasons that she could come back to life. And this also happens to people when they have things like, um, like heart surgery, where they'll like cool their body and they'll have clinical death, but like come back to life, so, yeah. I wanted to make a, a, if perhaps the best strategy, here I'm going after some, repeating something that David Chalmers uh, once said, but uh, you can actually collect as much information about your brain as you can. You can actually uh, freeze it, a cryopreservation, and let's say that you're rich enough to, to do all that, and assuming that technology is going to, let's say 50 years from now, technology is gonna be much, much better, and then the question is, is there enough information? For, so it's, let's say it's gonna have all of your DNA sequences and a bunch of information about yourself, plus your actual brain that's gonna be frozen. That's a huge amount of information. Nothing's gonna be alive. Now the question is, can these future generations bring you back online and, and somehow uh, regenerate uh, your consciousness. And what Chalmers said is a good strategy here is you can write a book that attempts to prove that this is impossible and then maybe those guys will do it just to spite you, <laughs> just to bring you back, <laughs> to prove that you're wrong. That's what they will do it. You know, I so, fought with uh, somebody in America, what George Ryan now they freeze the people. Oh, it's all right. Are you, you know, are you talking about these people, right? No, I'm, I'm just oh, saying that, that okay. uh, on a lighter note. But, but, but they must believe in it, otherwise they wouldn't do it. <laughs> I'll just say that, I, yeah, I've, I've been to Alcor and I got the tour. It's not actually all that expensive. So you sign over your um, life insurance policy. It's a conversation you might want to have with your spouse before you do it, but it's, uh, it's not prohibitively expensive. Um, but yeah, so it's full of uh, people who have signed up for this and... Uh, who are suspended in these giant vats full of uh, liquid nitrogen. It's mo mostly people preserve just their heads because they're not, it's cheaper, it is cheaper for storage <laughs> reasons, of course, yeah. You can fit a lot more heads in a jar than you can whole bodies. But also most transhumanists uh, are not interested in coming back to life in their old, decrepit, 80-year-old bodies. They want I think it would bodies. be much safer to <coughs> freeze the brain when it's still alive. Yeah, well, that's illegal <laughs> in, 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 uh, in most countries, I think, still. So if I would do it, I would, it, would do it this way. <laughs> yeah, but they actually they do want to get it as soon after death as possible. Um, so there are lots of people who uh, are very serious about this and have moved to uh, Phoenix to be close to Alcor when the <laughs> moment happens. So there's and, and the area around Dallas. It's just like a second coming. It's exactly like that, so yeah. I mean, we're, very, we're touching very close. New mythology. It. Yes, but, yeah, yeah. But the same story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it all touches really closely to sort of apocalyptic. But, but it's the opposite of the Roman sculptures and other sculptures where you kept the body and you changed the head, you know? Here <laughs> you keep the, keep the head and you change the body, as I'm saying. But otherwise, it's, it's very similar. Yeah. Uh, there's a question here, the lady. Thank you. I'm sorry if I'm putting a damper on the whole discussion, but <laughs> what I felt myself wondering or also like being frustrated, and I've had this feeling before when I was talking, me myself as someone who's studying mainly in the humanities, is when talking to uh, people who come from like the natural sciences or like uh, medicine or um, DNA and uh, genetics and so on is it's always seems to be and it has been so far mainly a discussion about okay what is doable what could we do and not a question about what should we do <laughs> or what are the practical implications if we can now map the brain because uh, for example something like transhumanism uh, to me seems in our world uh, there wouldn't be many good like ethical reasons for it, I feel like. But they are like, for example, I mean, you're a person of medicine. We also have like medical professionals here. So it's like, 
uh, what about all the people who don't have like uh, who have um, psychological psychological problems or people with disabilities and all these kinds of questions or also that uh, even artificial intelligence also inherits our own prejudices for example I'm sure you all heard about the racist um, <laughs> soap dispenser who wouldn't work for people with like a deeper skin tone or stuff like that and I so rarely hear uh, discussions about these questions. What is like the applicability, not like just in like a neoliberal capitalist sense, uh, if I want to live forever, but what about the actual people who live now? Yeah. And I would be interested uh, in your well, opinion yeah. on that. I, I mean, I actually see transhumanism as, and this is really the core of my interest in it, I see it as, uh, a kind of an extreme metaphor for capitalism, actually. I think um, there is no... Uh, I mean, it's a very radical set of possibilities and predictions for the future in a lot of ways, and it's like they're talking about these really like, huge transformative changes that are going to come because of technological innovations. But I think the thing that's most interesting and paradoxical about transhumanism is that it actually depends on nothing changing. It depends on capitalism continuing. It depends on sort of business as usual. And uh, it's a vision of like in increased uh, integration of technology and humanity, which, you know, technology is a neutral thing, of course, but the extent to which technology has already infiltrated our lives, it, you could say is not neutral. I mean, there are lots of ways in which um, the intimate relationship of people and technology has become quite problematic and dystopian in a lot of ways. And the big thing for me about transhumanism, um, <clears throat> I haven't been as critical as I, as I normally am this evening of, of this world, um, but the big thing for me is that the, the people who are going to live forever, the people who are really most invested in this idea, um, in, in all senses of that word, are generally very wealthy people. And so there is a presumption of like a perpetuation of privilege. And, you know, uh, if, if these sort of uh, immortalist technologies or like ways of living forever do come about, I, I can say pretty openly that I'm skeptical that it would be me who would benefit from it, even if I wanted to, which I don't. It would be Peter Thiel. It would be Elon Musk. Or Steve mm. Jobs. Like Steve Jobs, who might come back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I think that's a huge problem with this whole vision of tr specifically transhumanism. I mean, one of the things I always think of when I think about this problem is um, an interview I read with, with Peter Thiel, who is, uh, I'm sure most of you know who he is, um, a tech venture capitalist who founded PayPal and is, has invested in a huge number of these transhumanist technologies that I looked into. He's particularly uh, driven by um, the desire to live forever. And so he invests in a lot of immortal technologies. And in this interview, uh, the journalist asked him, w if, if these technologies came about, if, you, if there were somehow uh, a therapy or a group of therapies that could allow you to live forever, would that not just like radically intensify the kinds of social injustices that we're already seeing in society. So not only would you have wealth inequality, you would have lifespan inequality, and you would have like, uh, you know, super wealthy people who are living forever. Would that not just make matters worse? And Thiel's uh, response was the most incredible thing I've heard a transhumanist say. He said, well, for me, um, the, the biggest inequality in our society is the inequality between people who are living and people who are dead. Um, so it's like, it's just a vast, it's a, like, it's a, it's a huge difference in, in mindset. And, and that is kind of uh, the most extreme example of, the, of that kind of mindset that I was encountering all the time when I was writing about transhumanism. So in answer to your question, yes. <laughs> I have something on a, on a more pragmatic note. And since today's climate day, those of you who didn't notice the demonstrations, it turns out that uh, computation produces heat. And uh, this has to do with the second law of thermodynamics. Those of you are familiar with the Maxwell demon paradox, meaning it is, uh, some people claim theoretically impossible to uh, produce computation that doesn't generate heat. 
To do that, you'd actually have to uh, invent reversible computation, which, which is, uh, we still don't know how to do that. But the point is, for example, last year in Northern America alone, there was a, about 90,000 pounds of carbon dioxide produced just because of computation. And with the, this whole uh, wide orgy of selfies and the creation, incessant creation of records, most, most of them quite useless. Uh, we are, but also some serious simulations. Um, so when you do a serious simulation, sometimes it, it produces more CO2 than, uh, let's say, three cars and, 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 and two cows. And this is a huge problem. And obviously, when we think about these futuristic scenarios, when we have these huge databases, deep learning, and uh, the amount of bits that can be processed per second could actually uh, fry this whole planet. So this is just because it's climate day, let's, you know, we, we need to keep that in mind also. OK, I would like to take uh, one last question. Oh, oh OK, um, two, uh, OK, we'll, we'll combine then. You'll make them very brief, each one a sentence, and they go together. One, two, and then... Uh, OK, okay. Uh, brief, brief. Mm -hmm. great, uh, great panel. Uh, my question is, we're assuming that this future is going to have... In, people will have individual autonomy, but what I'm imagining is that once a digitized consciousness it becomes an individual, it's going to recombine with all of the other ones, and I want to talk about what the consequences of that are. Because you can't, like, opt out at that point, right? You're just in. You're in this new pool of oneness. Okay, thanks. That's such a great question. That's really interesting. Um, yeah. I suppose, uh, I like... It sort of just depends on how this uploading happens, I'd imagine. But, I, but there definitely is the fact that like, right now, because of the way our brains are, if I want to communicate information to you, I have to like, do it through words. Whereas, yeah, I suppose like, with a computer, you would have like, a better information exchange. But I don't know. It just feels too hypothetical to think about the implications. I don't know. Maybe as a philosopher, maybe you can think of some. I, maybe <laughs> yeah. But um, th th there's an interesting point here, and that is uh, some people do talk about the uh, so-called global brain scenarios, where uh, this is almost in the spirit of uh, Teilhard de Chardin. And, uh, and the idea is that uh, at some point, uh, we could, as technology advances, and, and, and uh, the processing time becomes more synchronous, when the processing becomes more synchronous, the time differences become much smaller, we may develop uh, some kind of collective consciousness. But again, since we have no idea what consciousness is, it's hard to answer. Also, the same problem arises in, with something that you mentioned, and that is that we don't know if a machine, for example, is conscious or not. There is a so-called uh, panpsychist. It's a very serious uh, philosophical school of thought that says that uh, maybe a grain of sand has some very rudimentary consciousness. Otherwise, it's very hard to explain. So if you say, okay, uh, everything is a little bit of consciousness, then it's, it's, it's a bit easier uh, to try and explain how consciousness uh, emerges, or be because otherwise, it's very hard to see how, how it emerges out of nothing. Maybe I, I could uh, comment, because we have um, an installation. It's not consciousness, but it's um, synchronization between brains. Um, and we might have a short look, because it's um, pretty appealing. So up to 20 people can control with their brains. Um, I can see that actually very well. So we, um, uh, dream scenarios. So this is an installation. Um, this is a dome installation where 20 people have these headsets on their head. And uh, we measure. Basically, synchronization, so different features of their brain waves, and they can control this visual um, uh, auditory scenery. And uh, they really, with their brains, control different actions. They can generate nightmares or pleasant dreams, and it depends on the interaction of all 20 dreamers and their brain activity features. Wait, this is amazing. Where is this? <laughs> <laughs>
<lacht> ja. So, das war es in Toronto. I want to go. <lacht> so, siehst du uh, Events? Um, das war es in die Blanche in, uh, in Toronto. Um, and we had it in Irvine. We have it at the Long Night of Science in Berlin also. But usually, so the dome is really expensive to rent. <lacht> so, this was a big dome. So, sometimes it's smaller installation. But uh, we try to do it as often as possible because the interest is really wow. very big. Yeah, that's I what I mean by if that. someone sells it in the right way, I'll <laughs> yeah. buy it. That, that's just happened. Yeah, I've, I've opted into I'm the in, group yeah. brain now. <laughs> You've sold it to me. Okay, uh, one very last question here. Yeah, you. Mm. 3,000 years ago, uh, wealthy, wealthy Egyptians uh, wanted to preserve the heart, the best way to keep the soul for eternal life. Nowadays, people from Silicon Valley want to preserve the brain uh, to keep their consciousness for eternal life, but why also not just to get a better brain? <laughs> like, why, why keep it? Uh, maybe we have, again, a philosophical problem with uh, maybe realizing that there is no consciousness and it's just a concept like the soul. Uh, that maybe uh, 100 years later people might laugh about <laughs> because right. it's kind of similar right now for me so maybe you can explain yeah I mean I, I was mentioning this I had this when I was studying um, like I definitely went in thinking oh, all this consciousness and then a lot of people were like well actually if we can explain all these processes why do we need consciousness to like why do we need to add this extra thing that doesn't seem to do anything and what purpose does it serve so um, yeah I'd kind of agree with you I mean Definitely, I'm sure, like, in the future, they might look at it differently in the same way as we do with people in the past. One, one tiny point. Uh, first of all, uh, you can think about having a heart, heart transplant, and you'll still be the same person. It's much harder to have a brain transplant and, and still be the same. So there's some reason that the brain does seem to... Also, it's very complex. It does a lot of things. So, uh, And then there's this business of eliminativism, is really becoming a bit more popular. But keep in mind one thing, uh, right now it is possible, at least you can be a skeptic, and say that you're really in the midst of a simulation and really you're hooked to a thousand electrodes on, on, on a hospital bed somewhere in a psychiatric ward and, and you're having this dream or simulation, so you can actually say, okay, this is possible, right? But to say that this, this illusion itself is an illusion, is much harder. So this is why limitivism, despite the fact that it, is, it has some attractive philosophical features, it's a very difficult uh, bullet to bite because you really have to become skeptic of the one thing that is hard for you to become skeptic. So that's just the point. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think it's, we, just, we want to think that there's something else. We want to think that if we can build a machine that was just like us and acted like us, for some reason, we're more special. And I sort of feel like that's part of the like psychological sort of motivation for that kind of belief. I don't Good, know. but you'd keep your bank account. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He wouldn't share. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I think um, we agree that um, there's a difference between a living body and a dead body. So you would uh, notice probably um, whether I'm living or dead, and it would be quite a difference. Um, so the question is now, what uh, is the feature that makes me living, right? And this is obviously that I am conscious, I'm experiencing something, right? Of course, I can sleep, but this is not not um, the type of consciousness. Right, sorry, Petra. And the, no, no, no. I'm I, I, I'm really wondering. Um, aren't the plants on your yeah, balcony that's the thing. not living? I would disagree. <laughs> yeah. So Are they conscious, lie, conscious or what? This is a very philosophical question. So the, the question is again: How do you define consciousness, right? So oh, in my, no, no, no. Please, <laughs> we have to be scientific here. So if we talk about consciousness, we need to define this term. If we define it as a complexity, because there was the argument, actually, it arises from the complexity. So if there is a complex no. organism... See, no, because mm -hmm. you can be alive and not conscious. Mm -hmm. Like, when you're asleep or if you're brain dead, mm -hmm. your body's alive. We describe alive as, like, a collection of processes, like, your heart is beating, you're respiring, your cells are metabolizing. There's a threshold between conscious and unconscious. Oh, there but, is so, or animals and... Uh, plants, for example. Mm. So why do you know that a plant does not feel anything? 
Oh. Why do I know that? Well, there is a, uh, like, I think we didn't. We a just theory that mm. like trees are in some way. <laughs> yeah, there is this sort of like panpsychist theory, but yeah. I think I'd, I'd assume that to feel something, you need say nerve endings. I can't feel, you know, like if someone cut my hair, it doesn't hurt me. So I'd assume because plants don't have nerve endings, they can't feel. But I don't know about consciousness. I, like, is so, there a thing it's like to be so a what, plant? What is actually the threshold between life and dead and consciousness and non-consciousness? So there's always uh, behind these terms complexity. If there's a certain degree of complexity, things are alive and they are conscious. So a mouse, a fish, a worm, a bacteria, the, the, so, so where does the consciousness start? See, I, I mean, I find this interesting because like in the, someone used the same argument to basically disprove consciousness to me when I was studying, which is basically they talked about I mentioned this yesterday, the Elan Vital, like the idea that like Victorians had, that they'd say, what makes something alive? And they'd say, well, there must be this extra force that makes something alive. And they'd call it like the Elan Vital. And now we don't think that. We don't study, we, we say, well, for something to be alive, it has to sort of respire. The cells have to like be metabolizing. When they all stop doing that, then something's dead. And someone else described it to me like, what if we start to think that about the brain? What if we say, um, you know, for someone to see their, like, these parts of their brain must be firing, and when it doesn't, then they're not conscious, as in that feeling of consciousness. And, like, maybe we can explain all of those processes without adding an extra thing, like consciousness, if that makes sense. Uh, well, um, uh, I'm not sure, um, but, but, uh, but I'm, I'm uh, look, um, I, I'm sure that I'm, uh, our time is uh, <laughs> uh, running um, out, and the, uh, um, uh, well, the good thing is that even if we continued for an hour or two, we wouldn't solve the problem. <laughs> we obviously um, uh, wouldn't, but I... Not with that attitude, we wouldn't. Uh, sorry? Not with that attitude. <laughs> no. Uh, 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 no, 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 and, and, no, um, I, no, I don't want to be defeatistic. I find it, I, I, I find it just wonderful that we won't. Um, uh, humans haven't solved those problems for 3,000 years now, um, uh, so we can be quite certain that we solve, won't solve them uh, in two hours, um, but uh, look, uh, when I prepared this session, I thought, um, uh, so may I make, to finish a personal statement, I'm, I'm, I'm highly skeptical about the uh, possibility of, um, of strong AI, strong AI is artificial intelligence, and that can do what, uh, what our minds can do, at least in the next, um, in the foreseeable futures. But then I thought, well, look, um, the whole thing, is so interesting um, that even if the whole thing was totally absurd, one would have to have that discussion because it's so inspiring and so pleasant and so stimulating. Um, and um, that's um, how I felt this panel was. Um, and I hope you feel this um, way. And I would like to um, uh, leave you with uh, Plenty, plenty ideas for thoughts and um, discussion for a whole Friday night. Thank you very much. <laughs>